So there's some facts about fungi that leave a little too much room for interpretation because like anything else in life, some things we think are true, but they just ain't. So in this video, I wanna go over some of the major mushroom myths and talk about a little bit of the nuance and hopefully demystify some of the things that we think to be true about mushrooms. You should be scared of mushrooms in the wild because they're poisonous and they can kill you. So, okay, yes, there are some deadly poisonous mushrooms. There are some mushrooms that if you eat them, if you eat enough of them, you will likely die or perhaps maybe need a liver transplant. But we don't think that way about plants, right? I mean, if you go out into the wild and pick a random plant, there's just as much of a chance that that plant could be poisonous as if you were to pick a random mushroom. According to Alan Rockefeller, who's a prolific mycologist and actually studies a lot of wild mushrooms to see what's in them, he says if you pick a wild mushroom, there's about a 1% chance that it's gonna contain psilocybin, about a 1% chance that it actually is gonna be deadly poisonous, about a 20% chance that it's gonna be poisonous but not deadly, about a 60% chance that it's just an edible mushroom and about a 20% chance that it's inedible or too tough to eat. I think those numbers would actually surprise a lot of people. I think most people think if you go out in the woods, it's going to be like a 50-50 chance or you're totally playing roulette with a wild mushroom, but the chances that you're dealing with something that's seriously poisonous are actually pretty low. Also, I know those estimations add up to 102%, not 100%, but we're playing with averages here. Now, these estimations have a caveat, of course. Depending on what time of year you're out in the wild looking for mushrooms or at the the location that you're looking for mushrooms, this could sway dramatically. You could be in a spot that just happens to have a lot of Amanita phylloides or the death cap growing. And in that case, it might actually be a 50-50 chance or there might be a ton of poisonous mushrooms growing. But in general, on the aggregate, the chances of finding a deadly poisonous mushroom are pretty low. Another myth that is also untrue is that mushrooms are dangerous to touch. I often see people posting pictures of harvesting mushrooms wearing gloves or wearing latex gloves. That might help protect you from poison an ivy or a tick or some bug or something like that, but it's not gonna do anything to help protect you from mushrooms because mushrooms are not dangerous to touch. In fact, a lot of experienced foragers will use taste as an identification technique. For example, they'll take a little nibble of the mushroom and then spit it out. They obviously won't swallow it, but they'll just kind of get a taste for it to kind of help identify it. Now, I'm not recommending you do this, but it just goes to show that in general, mushrooms are not dangerous to handle and the poisonous mushrooms are only super dangerous if you consume a fair amount of them. Also, unfortunately, there is no hard and fast rule of thumb for identifying a poisonous mushroom. Statements like all mushrooms that grow on wood are fine to eat or all mushrooms that have red caps are poisonous. Those statements just unfortunately aren't true. And the only way to really identify mushrooms is to go through the whole process because again, there is no hard and fast rule. So yes, some mushrooms are poisonous, but should you be scared of all mushrooms in the wild because they're all gonna kill you? No. Uh, mushrooms are cultivated, they grow in the dark and they eat poop. Okay, some do. One of the most commonly cultivated mushrooms in the world, Agaragus bisporus, or the common button mushroom, doesn't need light to grow properly and is often grown in the dark. It's also grown on compost. However, most mushrooms do actually like a lot of light. They need light to grow properly. They grow on a fresh, squeaky clean substrate like hardwood, and they do not, under any circumstances, grow on poop. Many of the popular gourmet mushrooms and functional mushrooms that you might be familiar with like to grow on things like oak or birch or other hardwoods. For example, reishi grows on logs and so does turkey tail. The oddball, of course, is cordyceps, which does grow on bugs, but that is a whole other animal. I mean plant, I mean fungi. If you pick a mushroom, or if you pick a lot of mushrooms, you're a bad person because it destroys the mushroom life cycle. I vividly remember being at the Telluride Mushroom Festival and they had this huge table full of mushroom fruiting bodies. And these were mushrooms that were harvested from around the area in Telluride. And the whole idea is that people would go harvest mushrooms, they would bring them to this table and their expert mycologists would help people identify these mushrooms. And then you could label them and leave them there for others to see and to learn about mushrooms. And then someone came up to the table and they were screaming and yelling at the mycologists just saying, this is unacceptable. And they started pulling them off the table and pulling the mushrooms out of the garbage as if they were gonna go back and plant them or something like that. I think they were worried that we were somehow damaging the mushrooms or damaging the organism and unfairly harvesting them just for the sole purpose of letting them rot on a table. You know what they say, mushrooms- Will make you do crazy things.
The truth is there are a lot of mushrooms in the woods and harvesting the fruiting body does absolutely no damage to the underlying network of mycelium or the underlying organism of the mushroom. That network will renew itself, no problem. And in fact, there have even been a lot of studies done on this because there is some incentive, right? Especially for wild mushroom harvesters who harvest say chanterelles or porcinis or something like that for the intention of selling them into the market. They would wanna know that if you're harvesting mushrooms year after year, you're not gonna eventually run out of mushrooms to harvest. So there's been studies done over periods of up to 30 years where they found harvesting the mushrooms does zero damage whatsoever to the underlying organism. And if mushrooms aren't harvested, they are pretty ephemeral. They don't last that long anyways. So once they fruit within a few days or within a week, they will just rot on the ground where they're sitting anyways. There is another myth that is kind of tied to this and it is that you should cut mushrooms off instead of pulling them out. And there's a lot of cut versus pick debates that happens all over the place, specifically specifically around morel mushrooms. And I've even experienced this myself. I posted a picture of me holding a morel mushroom that was clearly plucked out of the ground. A lot of people had a lot of things to say about this. In fact, if you were to have to pick one side, you'd be better off to pull the thing out of the ground because if you do cut the mushroom, it does leave a little bit where potentially a bacteria or some other infection could get in and potentially damage the mushroom. But overall, whether you cut or you pick, it doesn't matter whatsoever. And there's studies to back this up. So harvesting mushrooms does no damage to the organism. And in fact, you know, hunting mushrooms in the wild and bringing them to a big table so everyone can see probably even benefits the mushrooms in some way because education is beneficial for spreading the word and protecting the ecosystems because the true potential damage and the only thing that's actually gonna prevent mushrooms from being able to fruit in the future is habitat destruction. So if mushrooms lose the habitat in which they grow, they won't have the ability to fruit. But if we protect those habitats, we can expect many mushrooms for many years to come. So should you feel bad about harvesting a mushroom out of the wild, whether you pick it or you cut it? The answer is no, pick away. I do wanna add one caveat here though, because with anything in nature, obviously you wanna be aware of your potential impact. And yes, mushrooms produce fruiting bodies so they can produce spores so that they can be released into the air and create more mushrooms. And oftentimes it might be best just to leave the mushrooms alone and let them do their own thing. So in general, it's not harmful to pick mushrooms, but I mean, you wouldn't want to pick the last remaining agaricon east of the Rockies just because you wanted to have it on your shelf or something like that. So again, in general, picking mushrooms in the wild is not harmful to the organism, but there are always some caveats. Spores are bad. They're super dangerous to our health. We breathe in a lot of spores every single day, but luckily our bodies handle them and it's not like we're gonna to start to have mushrooms growing inside of our body. This seems to be a common concern for people growing mushrooms at home, specifically people growing mushroom grow kits of oysters or something like that that drops a ton of spores. They're worried about the spore load and the potential impact on the health of having those spores in their house. For most people in most situations growing mushrooms at home, this is absolutely nothing to worry about. Again, our bodies have the ability to deal with spores. It's something that we've developed by necessity just from living in the environment. That being said, there are some circumstances where a healthy level of concern about spore load might be something to consider. And those are people who might develop allergies to spores or people that are working in places that have heavy spore loads over long periods of time. There has been for sure documented cases of people developing allergies to spores. The first time I heard about this was actually on the shroomery from Roger Rapp Abbott, who became allergic to oyster mushrooms. In one of his posts, he said, it's all of the oyster family of species I'm now allergic to, from P. austriatus to H. ulmarius. Last summer, we had some oysters on straw logs down by the creek over 100 yards from the house. When they started dropping spores, I knew it right away. Next year, we'll have no oysters anywhere. I don't wanna have to wear a respirator. And actually wearing a respirator is what some people do who spend a lot of time in grow houses where oyster mushrooms are growing because oysters do in fact drop a ton of spores. And yes, over time, some people have apparently developed allergies to these spores. And if you want to work with mushrooms, you obviously don't want to have an allergy to them. So it should be something that you might want to be concerned about. I was also having a conversation with our friend Eric Whitehead over at Untamed Feast, which is a company that does wild mushroom harvesting for soups and stews and dried mushrooms. Basically what they do is they harvest lots of dried mushrooms and then lay them out on these trays. And when they're doing that, the spore load can be pretty enormous. And if there's so many spores flying around, he thinks anyways that 
it's something that you should be not concerned about, but at least aware of if you're working with that load of spores and that amount of mushrooms. There's also something called mushroom workers lung. And the first time that this condition was defined, it was from agaricus farms. And it was actually not from spores, but from a bacteria in the compost. And I think that term mushroom workers lung has now been extended to include people who are working specifically in oyster mushroom farms, where again, there's super high spore load, in which case they'll often want to wear a respirator. I think I'm getting the black lung, Bob. So I don't know if I can say that this myth is busted because yeah, some people do develop allergies and some people have had issues with spores, but in general, just walking around in the woods or growing a little mushroom kit at home, it's not something to worry about. Let me be clear, mushrooms are plants or vegetables. Mushrooms often get lumped in with the rest of the flora and fauna, but in fact, they are neither a plant or an animal. Mushrooms are actually part of the kingdom fungi, which is so unique that it doesn't fit anywhere else. The other kingdoms are animalia, which dogs and humans are a part of, plantae, which plants are a part of, and then protista and monera, which is bacteria and other things. Interestingly, in some ways, fungi are actually more similar to humans than they are to plants. For example, they breathe out CO2 and breathe in O2 or oxygen, where plants do the opposite. For example, right here, you know, the plant is giving off oxygen and the mushroom's using that oxygen while this one's dried, but if it were alive, it's using that oxygen and then giving off CO2, which the plant can use, and that is kind of circular. And in fact, there are even mushroom farms that also grow plants and they use the oxygen that the plants give off, pump it into the mushroom grow house and vice versa, use the CO2 that the mushrooms are producing from the mushroom grow house and pump it into the plant area. And it's kind of this regenerative thing that is super cool. But on this point where mushrooms are more similar related to humans than they are to plants. There's an often stated fact that mushrooms share 50% of their DNA with humans, which sounds pretty impressive until you realize that humans also share 60% of their DNA with a banana. So although it comes down to arbitrary definitions that humans have put on natural organisms, I think we can safely say that mushrooms aren't plants and this myth is busted. If you desire to make your brain bleed, you could go ahead and eat psychedelic mushrooms. Now, this is one I always heard as a kid when I was growing up. Mushrooms are psychedelic or they have those effects because they make your brain bleed. Brain bleeding is a serious medical condition, obviously. So if this were true, it would be a serious concern. But is it true? No, unless it was some giant mushroom that somehow managed to bash your skull in. Magic mushrooms have the effects that they do because they contain a compound called psilocybin, which turns into psilocin, which has an effect on your brain. Psilocin is very similar in its chemical structure to serotonin. And basically, serotonin changes the way your brain circuits behave. It's perhaps best known for mood regulation. Now, psilocin gets in your brain and elbows all the serotonin out of the way, plugs into the same receptors that serotonin would plug into. This is why you have these effects. It does seem like this brain bleeding myth is also perpetrated for other psychedelics like LSD, which also doesn't make your brain bleed. And I don't necessarily think it's scientific misunderstanding, but more so maybe just a myth that's perpetrated for the purpose purposes of putting some fear out there for some of these psychedelic compounds. In fact, there's even some evidence out there that psilocybin containing mushrooms might even help to grow a brain through a process of neurogenesis, which is the complete opposite of making your brain bleed. And I find that pretty interesting. Mushrooms are many things, but they are not nutritious. So mushrooms grow in the dark. They grow in manure. They're not good for you. They're void of any nutrition. I mean, they're mostly just made up of water anyways. Although it's true, mushrooms are like 90% water for the most part. This is something that was common knowledge for a long time. And I guess it would be easy to be convinced that this is true because if you're thinking about button mushrooms, they're just these little spongy things that yeah, they do grow in the dark and yeah, they do grow in compost and yeah, they're mostly water. But I think the reason why this myth was perpetuated for so long is because mushrooms are actually really low in calories. But just because they're low in calories does not mean that they are low in nutrition. In fact, mushrooms, even the common button mushroom, are super high in vitamins, nutrients, and minerals. For example, button mushrooms are actually packed with B vitamins, which is good for energy, riboflavin or vitamin B2, which helps with hormones. They're also high in niacin, which is B12 and good for maintaining healthy red blood cells. And they're also a leading source of selenium, which is actually an important antioxidant. They also contain things like copper and potassium 
potassium, which are actually super important, and they can contain high levels of vitamin D if they are exposed to sunlight. Oyster mushrooms, which have also been kind of considered just a boring, non-nutritious mushroom, actually do have a lot of nutritional benefit. Take something like ergothionine, for example, which is a compound that is actually on deck to be considered a new vitamin, which is a big deal because if something is considered a vitamin, it means that it is number one, essential to human health, and number two, it has to be obtained from the diet. So if oyster mushrooms contain ergothionine, which might even be a new vitamin, that's a pretty important thing. And that is not even considering the superstar of functional mushrooms like reishi, chaga, and lion's mane, and turkey tail. These are mushrooms that contain things like fungal beta-glucan, and triterpene, and other amazing compounds that are super beneficial for health. So it might be time to update those old nutrition books because mushrooms are way more than just empty calories. Consider this myth busted. So hopefully that busted some of the myths and got rid of some of the mush conceptions that you might have had about mushrooms. But if we missed anything, if there's something that you think is to be true about mushrooms that might not be, let us know in the comments below. I love to hear different mushroom myths as we try to continue to spread the spores, teach people about mushrooms, and get you excited about the fifth kingdom. Thanks so much for watching and we'll see you in the next video. Do you want to become a functional mushroom expert? I've got just the thing for you. It's a new ebook called Mushroom Powered, the history, the science, and the benefits of the world's most fantastic fungi. At over 130 pages, it's absolutely packed with all the information you need to know to learn about the world's most powerful medicinal mushrooms. And the best part, it's 100% free. You can download it right now. Just click the link in the description, enter your email address, and I will send it to you right away. I hope you love it.